you take your Bibles and turn to Galatians chapter 3, Galatians chapter 3, verse 1 to 14, Galatians 3, verse 1 to 14, and I've asked Dawn if she'd read the little scriptures for us this morning. Um, I'm reading from the New King James. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portray portrayed among you as crucified? This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of the faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, or are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of the faith? Just as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for, faith, for righteousness. Therefore, know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. For the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs from the tree. That the blessing of Abraham might become, come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Thank you, Donna, for reading God's word for us this morning. Let us pray before we look at these words this morning. Father God, we thank you for this time we have now to study your word and for you to speak to us through it, Lord. May you draw us ever closer to you through these words. Now, Lord, we ask you to open our eyes to see you, open our ears to hear from you, and give us the courage to put into practice what you teach us this morning. For these things we're praying in the name of Lord Jesus. Amen. Dr. Phil Williams, don't get him confused with Dr. Phil on TV, completely different Dr. Phil. Dr. Phil Williams once said this, the law is the light that reveals how dirty the room is, not the broom that sweeps it clean. Let me read that to you again. The law is not the light that reveals how dirty the room is. Sorry, the light is the light... Oh, let me try that again. <laughs> the law is the light that reveals how dirty the room is, not the broom that sweeps it clean. I think that Dr. Phil Williams made a pretty good statement here. Because this morning, as we'll see, the purpose of the law, first of all, isn't about salvation. The law can't save us. Our, our works can't save us. But as what Christ has done, as we'll look again in this passage this morning. 
you have your Bibles, turn again to Galatians chapter 3, verse 1 through 15. We're actually going to only look at the first nine verses of chapter 3 here this morning. And in a couple of weeks, we'll look at verse 10 through 14. Uh, next week is actually Pentecost Sunday. And so we'll be celebrating Pentecost Sunday and talking about the Holy Spirit. And so that's why we'll be continuing this next Sunday, but we'll be back at it the Sunday after. Um, but we're going to look at verse 1 through 9 this morning. Uh, and two main points that we'll look at this morning. Uh, we need to recognize and remember that it is Christ who justifies us. Uh, this is one of these big theological terms called justification. And justification isn't something that we do, and it's not what the law can do. It's what Christ has done for us. He is the one who justifies us. And as he justifies us, he redeems us. He makes us holy and sanctified. So the first point we look at this morning is this. The supply of the Spirit by faith. So as we look at the law versus faith, we need to understand that that we're supplied of the Spirit by faith. Look at verse 1 of chapter 3. It says here, first of all, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Paul here is getting a little ornery with the Galatians a bit here. O foolish Galatians. Paul is being pretty bold here as a, as a way to get the attention of the church. Um, it's not always good necessarily to call someone foolish. Um, scripture even talks about that. Not to call a person foolish. It's, it's, it's only God's place to call someone foolish. But here Paul isn't breaking what Jesus said. It's, it's, it's a, a means that Paul's trying to use to get the church in Galatia attention. How, how many of us here were like that if we had a guest preacher here with some Sunday? Because I'm not going to do it. But uh, if we had a guest preacher who said to us, Oh, foolish New Life Christian community, uh, would that get your attention? Probably would. We probably wouldn't like that either, would we? But it would get our attention. And that's what Paul's doing here to get their attention. Like, focus here, Galatia. You are believing some things that are wrong here. You're, you're believing that you're getting salvation from the law because as we've seen already in the book of Galatians, and we'll see again further, there's some people came amongst them in Galatia, in the churches, and tried to get them to think that they're saved by works, saved by circumcision, as we've already seen in Galatians, and we'll see also again in Galatians later. And Paul again is trying to get their attention, reminding them, hey, stop paying attention to this stuff that they're teaching that are, are wrong. And further in verse 1, who has bewitched you? Well, here's a pretty strong term again, too, because bewitched in, has a lot to do with the occult, with with magic. Um, still not real magic. It's, it's basically occultism or Satanism. Um, spells and, and curses, things like that. And, and Paul's not saying that they are cursed, but he's seen it as a means to remind them, hey, you're, what caused you to start believing a false gospel? So we're called, like the church in Galatians, not to allow those who are teaching falsehoods to bewitch us, to be led astray from false teachings, specifically when it comes to the law versus faith. Because it's not the law that saves us, as we we'll see in our passage. Again, verse 2. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law, or by hearing with faith? Now, this is actually a rhetorical question that Paul is asking, because obviously the point is, they didn't receive their salvation by works. As we see elsewhere in God's word, it says that uh, we do not receive salvation by works, lest anyone should boast. It's only through Christ. It's not from any deeds that we do. Further then, in verse 2. 
sorry, verse 3. Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit? Sorry. Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Again, Paul isn't necessarily asking questions for an answer, but to get them to think and realize, yeah, it, they're not being perfected by the flesh either. Uh, the word flesh here, the Greek word here is sarx, and it literally means our, our skin. But in an allegorical sense, it means the sin nature the nature that we've been born into. And and it's something that doesn't save us either. So trying to deal with the flesh and try to live in our own vein, we are not then working towards salvation. No amount of works that we can do can save us. After all, Paul says in verse 4, again in the questions here, did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Verse 5, does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Paul again in verse 4 is talking about the suffering that the people in the church of Galatia suffered. We know as Christians we are all going to suffer in some way at some point in our lives as Christians. It's inevitable. Jesus suffered, we're going to suffer. Whether it be physical pain or mental or emotional pain, maybe it's persecution. Either way, we are going to suffer in some way. And Paul is saying to the church in Galatia, did your suffering, is that all in vain? Are you now trying to do works again to be saved when it's by faith? Because if you can do it by works, then suffering has no purpose. But if we work in faith, then suffering does have a purpose. Because usually when we follow God's direction in faith, that is what brings about suffering sometimes. Not intentionally. I don't think God intentionally brings about suffering, but God allows it to happen. And sometimes it's not necessarily a lesson. Sometimes it can be a lesson for us, but not always. Sometimes suffering has to do with God wanting to use it to draw us closer to Him. I know the times where I feel closest to God has been in times of suffering where I've had to be dependent upon God. Yes, it's good to have those high times, those non-top experiences, to feel like we're close to God then. But we're closest really to God when we're suffering. When we're relying on Him. And Paul is in essence saying that if we have suffered, our suffering's in vain then if we're trying to do works for salvation. Because he follows it up again in verse 5 about how, about how the Holy Spirit is supplied to us. The Spirit who does miracles and does great works. Is it from the law? Or is it by faith? Again, it's by faith, not by works. The Father in Jesus supplies the spirits to us when we come to faith in Jesus. And it's through the Holy Spirit that we're convicted and reminded to live by faith. So we must not squelch the Holy Spirit. As I said earlier, we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit more next Sunday as it's Pentecost Sunday. But I think this is key here again, as we'll see later on in Galatians in chapter 5 when we get there. The Holy Spirit is key in all of this. Because we are living by faith, not by works. I actually had a conversation with a person online this week. Um, there's a video from an atheist that was talking about the issue of slavery. And one person said, well, so where's your evidence for God? And I asked him the question, are you actually ready to see the evidence for God? And then he asked, well, what, do you have a strand of hair or, or his body or, or, or something physical to show? <coughs> and I said, it shows to me that you're actually not ready to see the evidence. 
and which is typical of, of, of most atheists. They're not ready to hear the evidence because they want the hard physical, the physical thing to show evidence for God. There's far more evidence than the physical. I even asked the question, uh, do you need physical evidence for logic? That's impossible, isn't it? Because logic isn't physical, it's not tangible. But yet we know there's laws of logic that God has given us. We've discovered it because God is a logical God. Now, yes, sometimes we don't understand God's logic, but God has the ultimate logic. And a person like that, too, doesn't have the Holy Spirit yet. The Holy Spirit is key to live by faith. Then verse 6 it says this, Just as Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Since we're justified by faith in Jesus Christ, it is Jesus Christ who justifies us and weaves us and grafts us in to the nationhood of Israel. Now, we may not be Jewish. We may not be citizens of Israel. But Jesus also talks, Paul also talks about this. I think it's in the book of Romans, how we're grafted into the body of Israel, into Israel's inheritance. And I think that's why Paul writes this in verse 6 again. Just as Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. When we have faith in God, it's that faith because of God, our faith is placed on, on something, that being God, then we are declared righteous by God. The word righteous here is a Greek word, dikaisein, a sign. And it means the quality or state of practice of judicial responsibility with focus on fairness, equitableness, and fairness. So in other words, it's, it's what's right. It's what's fair. Another definition for this term righteous is this. The quality or characteristic of upright behavior. So it's about justice and right behavior. We are called to live in this way, to have right behavior. There is some in Christianity, and I dare say that are in Christianity, that say that there are some sins that, oh no, it's, it's okay. You can do whatever you want. But then it shows that we're not righteous. Because righteousness, again, is upright behavior. It's what God defines as morality. That's part of my conversation with this person this past week. The person asked, well, what's your moral stance then? Like, what's your moral opinion of, of slavery? And I said to the person, it's not for me to determine what is morally right. That's God's job. It's funny because in this world, some people say that, well, morals, they evolve. No, they don't. There's a moral standard that God has given us. Someone outside of humanity who has declared that law of morality. And for anyone to say that God is immoral, they are misplacing their role and their responsibility. That's God's role. God declares what is morally right and wrong. And when we follow God's way and be led by the Holy Spirit, then we can live in righteousness. And here again, verse 6, it said it's how Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness because his faith in God was an action of belief towards God. So the supply of the Holy Spirit is by faith. When we have faith in God, we supply the Holy Spirit. And then we're also rewarded with righteousness. Second thing we learn in this passage is that we're blessed by faith. We are blessed by faith. 
In verse 9, we, it says this, So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Going back again, talking about how we're grafted into the nation of Israel, some who will teach out there that in the New Testament, when it refers to Israel, it's particularly in prophecy that it's actually a replacement of the church instead of Israel. That the church is Israel. That's not true. When God's word says Israel, it means Israel. But think of it this way, kind of like a Venn diagram, where you have Israel and you have the church. There are some who are part of Israel who are part of the Old Covenant, and God's Word doesn't say that God has broken that covenant with Israel. That covenant still stands with Israel. But God, through the New Testament, has given us a new covenant by which all can be saved. Now, that doesn't mean that everyone in Israel is saved because under the New Covenant, they still need Christ's salvation. They don't need to sacrifice a lamb or a ram for their sins anymore. Christ has done that for them. But God still has a promise for Israel. And so it's kind of like a Venn diagram when you have both, it's over more of like an overlapping. Prophecy actually even shows that at some point, Israel is going to turn back to God. The whole nation of Israel. All Jews are going to turn back to God. And they'll worship the one true God. In Jewish culture these days, they're just as secular as we are here in North America. They're no different, really. The atheism is about the same percentage as it is in, in Canada and the States. The belief in God is actually decreased in Israel. But God's Word tells us there's going to be some things that happen that's going to draw Israel back to belief in Him. Thus then, that diagram, diagram becomes one and the same. So God's word is saying that Israel is Israel, the church is the church. But again, as Paul says in Romans, we are grafted in to Israel because of the new covenant. So we are blessed by faith. Verse 7 says this, Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. Again, Paul's not saying that Israel aren't the sons of Abraham. They are. Well, we become sons and daughters of Israel because of faith in Jesus. Verse 8. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, and you shall all the nations be blessed. There we have it there. Through Abraham, you might remember in the stories of Abraham, of when God's talking to Abraham, God tells Abraham, it's going to be through you that all the nations are blessed. First of all, that they be a mighty nation, so numerous that even the stars in, in the sky or the sands of the seashore are, the number of those who will be part of Israel is greater than those things. But we are also brought in to be part of that by faith in Jesus. And it mentions here about, again, Scripture in verse 8. And the Scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. The Scripture being God's Word. Now some would say that, well, this is saying Jesus um, but no, it's the Word of God. Yes, Jesus is the Word incarnate. But we see in Scripture the prophecies of how Jesus was going to come through the line of David, how He'd be born, and how He would die later on the cross and rise on the third day and save us from our sins. That by faith in Him, we have salvation. So truly all nations are blessed through Abraham because of Christ, Christ's sacrifice for us. No wonder then in verse 9, Paul says, 
that of those of faith are blessed, along with Abraham, the man of faith. We're going to stop there for today. In two weeks, we'll continue this conversation of the law versus faith. But just a reminder here of these two points this morning again. We're blessed by faith. And the Holy Spirit is supplied by faith in God. Because it's about faith. It's not about the law. The law, yes. The law does show us our sin. But it also shows us our need for Jesus. And why we need to have faith in Him. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank You so much that You came and died on the cross in our place so that we might receive Your gift of salvation. Lord, Christianity is unlike any other religion. All other religions say you have to work to get salvation. You have said that's not the way. You died in our place. And if we come to you, believe in that you died in our place for our sins and was raised on the third day by the Father, that we would be saved. So Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have supplied salvation for us. That you and the Father have supplied the Holy Spirit to us by faith in you. And that we are blessed by faith in you. Lord Jesus, thank you for your great kindness and love you've shown to us. Lord, may we remember that we don't need to earn salvation anymore. Yes, we do want to be obedient to you and, and walk in holiness, but it's because we love you, because of your great kindness to us. So Lord, even in the moments that we talk about this sermon and, and as we leave this place, Lord, may we l remember to live in the freedom you've given us. We don't have to live by the law, but we can live in faith and show our love to you. We don't need to earn salvation. God, you are truly a good God.